Amen. Go to page three of your notes. I just want you to sort of just imagine. Imagine that you were Caleb or Joshua in the midst of two million people or more that uh, don't believe they can do it, believe that they're going to be wiped out, that the devil's going to win and it's all finished and there's nothing they can do about it. But these two keep going for a whole generation and then God gives them a next generation which enables them to come into their inheritance. Amen? So I want you to see that's where we are and it's not a matter of age because as I pointed out these two guys were 85 when, but they were still of that cutting edge generation that related far better to the next generation than they did to their own generation. So if you're just alone in your city and no one will listen to you, then God will give you another generation that will listen to you. <laughs> Amen. And I believe there's going to be something incredible happen amongst the younger generation. That, that uh, um, But we want to be of that heart and spirit so that we can give them our fatherly wisdom, but in, in the power and passion of that young generation. Amen. Something else which I'm going to say several times is that every one of these people that became a model, if you like, of receiving a great inheritance for themselves and for the succeeding generations, every one of them was a warrior and was a fighter. You think of Abraham, you think of Joshua, we're going to look at David tomorrow, and, uh, you, and you'll find that every one of them, and I'm going to think of some more which I've forgotten for the moment, but all of them were warriors. Caleb was a warrior. And I think that's saying something to us because I think what God's looking for now is people that have got the, the, the faith and the, the, the guts, if that's the, yeah, that's the right word, to, to say, well, God, you know, I'm going to believe you rather than look at my circumstances. And, uh, and, and I believe that, that we can win the war spiritually and we can see transformed cities and we can see... Whole, just imagine America with no drug problem. There's not a downtown area which is dangerous because there's no crooks or criminals. Yeah. Is that too hard for the Lord? No. I don't think it is. No. I don't think it is. But we're going to have to start to let what God's saying program us rather than maybe what all Christian society seems to be saying. And God's going to give us a generation that's going to be uh, and they are, it is rising up and it is, I believe, there are signs in America, there are signs in England, there are signs in Poland and other nations in Croatia and in uh, Slovenia of a young generation, uh, Hungary and Romania, there's something happening there and it's, it's sort of gathering momentum. Even in the south of Spain right now, something is beginning to happen. And, and only uh, when I think of my beloved India and what could happen there in the next two or three years, it's absolutely mind-blowing to think of that possibility. But, it, but it, 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 and say, well, you know, I want, I, I mean, cry out for the Caleb spirit. It doesn't matter what, what, how old you are, you can have it to 110 and still be biblical. <laughs> Amen? All right, let's move on now and go to page three. And I just want to point out something about Scripture. Scripture is, every word is God-breathed, every word of Scripture is inspired by God, but I did begin to touch just before the break on the, the limitation of human language. And I also want to just also, without in any way taking away from the divine inspiration of Scripture, the, 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 liber, the limitation of the person through whom God chooses to write Scripture. And I want to give you just, I, mean, I, I could, you know, I, just, I want to get you thinking about these things. I've not time to develop them. But let, let's take the Gospel of Mark, for example, written by a young man. And if you look at the Gospel of Mark, you'll find certain things. The, the key word in Mark is straightway or immediately. The second thing about this Gospel of Mark is that it's the briefest of all the four Gospels. It doesn't contain hardly any discourse passages, but it's all action, 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 action. And if you only had the Gospel of Mark, you would have a, a, a biblical and true revelation of Jesus and his ministry, but it would only be part of the picture. Can you hear what I'm saying? It's got its place, and it was and is a very powerful evangelistic tool. 
But then if you go on to some of the other scriptures, you find that they're writing from a much, from a much greater uh, depth and maturity. For example, I put here, taking a subject like knowing the Father, uh, Mark mentions the Father no more than, I think it's eight times in his whole gospel. John writes 160 times about the Father. And the Apostle Paul has 120 passages about the Father because they've seen something and they've got something to impart to us which didn't come with a quick straight way, let's get boom, boom, boom. No, that's all good, but it's not the total picture. And, and so we begin to understand, and this is what, you know, that there is something about walking with God a long time and, 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 being, and using every minute of that long time in the best possible way to be continually enriched in your wisdom and knowledge of God. But it takes God time to get you to see things in order from those things to see the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Now John, the apostle, was deliberately kept alive for another 30 years longer than any of the other apostles. He spent a good section of those 30 years locked up in a, a, a prison for 14 years, probably so he couldn't go out visiting churches and be so busy preaching he hadn't got time to think or write. <laughs> in fact, most of Paul's letters were written from prison and it's a warning to me, I'd better be careful. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm I realise now that, that, that time out with God to, to get something from God and then to be able to write it is going to be perhaps one of the greatest contributions that I can make in my remaining years. Amen. I mean, I love to be an evangelist. I love to go and see people saved. There's nothing that excites me more than to hear a, a fresh new convert telling me of his utterly transformed life. It just happened to me just at the beginning of this meeting. I was so excited. But, but there's something that comes. And, and then when it's written, then it becomes a resource of all that maturity so that we can get to where they got, not in you know, 90 years in the case of John, but we can get there in a few years. Now there's a principle. So, so that means that if we are towards the end of the road, we ought to be having those sort of resources which we can freely give away to other people. It's a tragedy if they die with us. Isn't it? And if we're at the, if we're at the mark end of the equation, then we need to get hold of a few Johns and Pauls and say, pour me in, into me everything that you've got because then I can then go on and go so much farther and do so much more. And we're going to look later on at the actual act of impartation, which is a different thing altogether, but that's incredibly powerful. I remember um, Eileen will mention this on, uh, I believe on Wednesday afternoon, Reinhard Bonnke told us once that when he was just walking the streets of London, by chance he happened on the house of George Jeffreys, one of the Jeffreys brothers, which was used for the mighty Pentecostal revival in Great Britain. He went in to see this old man, this old man laid hands on him and imparted something to him which utterly transformed him and moved him into the kind of ministry that he has today. So there's something mysterious about impartation, but there's something extremely powerful about it. And we're going to be looking on Thursday morning for very precise prophetic exactitude about what's being imparted. Because I believe God's going to do something which is going to be permanently transforming in a number of people that have gathered to this, this uh, gathering and we're coming to a climax on Thursday but the, the ministry of the word is going to, in my view, is the best way to prepare for that event and then afterwards to use it properly because as we pointed out the tragedy is that that generation that followed Joshua somehow he wasn't able to impart what he had to another generation to keep the momentum going and they went into the most appalling backsliding and then they went to a period of judges and then they asked for a king and basically rejected God because uh, the, the whole nation lost its way through lack of proper generational transmission. And I've read, we, I think we need to take these things, you know, as I've prepared this, and as you know, I had a, a struggle about what the subject of this particular school of the world would be and I had several thoughts in mind and, and I... Uh, cancelled them and then finally I got to this and I realised that this was what God wanted to do. And the more I got into it, the more I became 
um, in a, a right way, serious about this event. And, and in, a, in a new way, I've become um, diligent myself to make sure, A, that I'm rightly a father, and secondly, that what I impart is not polluted or contaminated, and what I've got to give is a vast resource that I can give to the next generation, so that my joy is not so much in what God does through me, but what I see them do because of the, because of the, the right godly transference of stuff. Does that make sense to you? So even the scriptures, if you like, teach us the power of, of building vast deposits of treasure within us and then by the written word we can become a tremendous disseminator of those treasures. There are lots of books that don't need to be written and a lot of books are written too soon. I remember John Wesley who wrote, uh, you may have, I might have read this book, it, it was a, a simple, what was the, the exact title? A plain statement of Christian perfection, and it, but he wrote it at, fairly near the beginning of his ministry. And then he rewrote it again 25 years later, and the interesting thing is that in the, the second edition, he's got his own comments on what he said in the first edition. And he says, boy, that's too strong. <laughs> and I would never say it that way now. Or I wouldn't change a word of that. And, he, and he's got this tremendous, honest appraisal of his own stuff. And actually, what he wrote 25 years later was far better than what he wrote in the beginning. Certain kinds of books need to be written when we are at a level of maturity to write them in a way that's, that's of powerful impartation to the next generation. But if we're writing to make a name for ourselves or to get ourselves on the map, then that's a totally wrong motivation. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Amen. Let's move on. These days you, can, you can't find the good books for all the books that didn't need to be written. Is that not true? Yeah. All right. So God deliberately kept the Apostle John alive for at least another 30 years. And he shut him away for a large part. It deeply taught him with amazing experiences and revelations, much more than any other man, even Paul. You find in the previous chapter, I point out that Paul had such a revelation that Peter himself says in 2 Peter 3.16, the things that write, Paul writes are hard to understand. Now, Paul had three, if you like, pieces of equipment which we need to recognize. He had an amazing spirit which was able to receive revelation. And that's something which you cultivate. And again, let me say that the Western system of education tends to produce pygmy-spirited people and with heads far too big for their spirit. Yeah. We're totally out of balance. In Africa, where the spirit world is so real and the spirit realm is such an everyday thing, there's far greater developed spirit sensitivity, but there isn't always necessarily the teaching to keep it on the rails. So each of us have got the strengths and the weaknesses of our culture which we need to recognize. But we need to say, God, I, wanna, I want to learn, and I want you to teach me how to grow my spirit, how to develop my spirit. So that it can become, because Paul was a man of great education, a man of great intellect, and yet he had the most amazing spirit, because he saw the whole issue of the Jew and Gentiles with a clarity that no one else in his generation saw it. And I don't think anyone hardly has ever seen it since. He went into the great, and, and the, the revelation of the Father, which I've already touched upon. He had a revelation which was absolutely amazing. Then he had a good intellect, which his spirit could then use to be a better teaching of that a better teacher of that revelation than almost anybody else. So I'm not disparaging intellect and I'm not disparaging great teaching gift, but it's got to be put in the proper relationship to the primary uh, uh, driving force of divine revelation. Does that make sense to you? And I think the Apostle Paul is probably the best example, certainly in Scripture, and I wonder how many more have ever come anywhere near him in, the, in the, all the generations that have followed. And the Apostle John goes into great deep, deep revelation, but certainly Paul goes way beyond Peter. 
And Peter says in 2 Peter 3.16, he says, Paul writes a lot of things hard to understand. In other words, he's way beyond me. And so if all these things flow together, we become you know, a resource and a gift to the body of Christ to help them. I remember when I, when I was um, not saved and I was a lecturer, I lectured in um, a college of advanced technology for a number of years and my joy was to take young men and a few women, there weren't so many women in those days, and, and when, not just to teach them to pass an exam, but I taught them until the lights went on and they understood the principle. That was my joy. And that's carried on into the things of the Spirit. And when I got saved, the Lord forbade me to go to any Bible college. He forbade me to go to any seminary because he said, I want you to feed my sheep, not my giraffes. That's what he said. So he said, I will be your tutor. And I had, I had access to an incredible uh, theological library because every missionary that died in India, their books were, were, were donated to this, this uh, evangelical library in Bombay, which we had the trusteeship of. So we had a better library than many theological seminaries. But the only tutor I had was the Holy Spirit. He said, go and read this, go and study that. And he gave me a sort of weekly tutorials, and I had to go back and present my findings to him. And I tell you, he's a great teacher. And as, as a result, I'm not squeezed into a Calvinist mode or, or a, a Arminian mode or a, the, you know, or a, a holiness mode. I'm just, I'm just being roamed free and read all kinds of banned books. <laughs> and I realized what God was doing now. He wanted me to become, you know, to be the kind of thinker that I am. And yet it, it all begins with revelation. If I don't get revelation, I've got nothing valuable to think about. But once the revelations come, then how to get it into words, how to put it in some sort of logical order, and how to convey it in such a way that other people can receive it and grasp it and receive the, the joy of the revelation which is burning inside me. And you hear me again and again. Uh, do you understand? Have you got that? Because I, I find even my words are not conveying what my spirit knows. And I'm thinking, oh, I wish I could say it better than that. And Jesus had the same problem. He said to them, he said, look, I've taught you the best way I can about the Father. That's what he basically says. I've spoken to you in figurative language. I've used the best words I can find to tell you about this Father that is in my total life, my total passion, and my whole relationship is to know the Father, love the Father, and obey the Father, and I live in this daily, daily communion. I live by the Father, and I want you guys to get into this, and I've done my best in words, but until the Spirit comes and shows it to you, I know you're not going to really know what I'm talking about. And one of the, the regrets, because I had a revelation of the Father way back in 1965, which was a revelation. It, it, it was not, I got some new truth. I didn't learn anything intellectually, but the Spirit came and showed me the Father, and I was just blown away by this. And I, it, it just utterly transformed me. It's been the root and foundation of my life ever, ever since. It was a day when it began. It was September the 25th, 1965. But I'm still continuing to deepen and expand that which began on that particular day. And I now know what Jesus is talking about. And I understand his frustration. Because I know that when I speak things, like even these things we're going to go over the next few days, I think, God, I'm finding the best words I can, but I know it's got to come by revelation. And I pray that one of the great things that will happen to everyone in this conference is, is that you will get a, such a burning revelation of the Father, which John was primarily kept alive 30 years to tell everybody else about, because it took him that long to get it. And if we get that, and we start to live by the Father the way that Jesus did, and if we start to work with the Father the way that Jesus did, and if we pray as sons of the Father the way that Jesus did, and if we have access to all our Father's treasure the way that Jesus had, we're going to start to literally reproduce his life again on earth, which is what he passionately wants us to do. Amen? If you get nothing else out of this conversation, that will be well worthwhile. <laughs> Amen.
I've just come to the end of this, this, this page. That these, now, as you know, John, at the end of his life, he was about 95 before he began to write his first book. So I've got a few years to go yet. And then he wrote the, the New Gospel of John and the Three Letters of John and, of course, that amazing document, the Book of Revelation. And I think you've got to get to John's level of intimacy and knowledge of Father before you can begin to understand the Book of Revelation. I think I've read every commentary on the Book of Revelation that anybody's ever written, and I'm totally dissatisfied with every one of them, or somewhat dissatisfied. Now, in saying that, I could do no better. And I feel one of my responsibilities at the end of my life is to get into that and bring a present-day revelation so that we begin to understand how we really prepare ourselves for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And a lot of these little fancy, neat, you know, theories which people have put forward, they, they're full of holes and they don't satisfy my spirit. How about you? Amen. Amen? But I can't do any better at the moment. So, But it took John that long to write it, so maybe it's going to take us that long to understand them. Amen. So it is with men and women who've walked with God a long time. If, they, if they've used their time properly, they have a depth of understanding of God and his ways, which comes out of that long time, as, as John puts it in, in his first letter, knowing him that was from the beginning. He says, I write to you fathers, for you know him that was from... I mean, that's the main qualification for fatherhood, is to have a knowledge of God. Otherwise, we haven't got a right to father people. Amen? Knowing him that was from the beginning. And, 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 and I, I just know God. Right? As a result, we'll be able to go much further and so on with each succeeding generation that is, if this is working properly. If only we can transmit this. Now let's move on to page four. I want to spend the rest of the time on Abraham, the root and source of all generational blessing. Abraham's name was at first Abraham. I'm sure you know that which means exalted father. God later changed it to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. This change of name was a great prophetic statement of God's promise and purpose to Abraham. In other words, Abraham, you really are going to have a multitude more than the stars in heaven or more than the sand on the seashore for number. I really am going to make this happen. And so his change of name was a prophetic statement of God's confidence that he could make it happen. Abraham is destined to become the father of all that believe, both circumcised and uncircumcised. Romans chapter 4, verse 11. He's everybody's father, circumcised or uncircumcised, providing we believe like Abraham and, and go through the process um, that he went through. Abraham through Abraham we're promised in Genesis 12, 4, all the families, the, the Hebrew word is the word mishpachor, is, is the best way I can pronounce it. And this is a word to describe what today I think we would call a people's group. It's not a nation, and it's not a natural family, but it, it's a company of people that have come together with some kind of common identity. And Jesus promises or I'm sorry, God promises to Abraham that every single people's group on the face of the earth is going to be blessed. And Acts chapter 3 and verse 26 tells us what that blessing mainly consists of. Because we read him, uh, Peter, as he's preaching, he says, now that promise has been fulfilled in the city of Jerusalem when the Spirit was poured out and a bunch of people came out of the upper room absolutely bursting with this new wine and shook the whole city. Mighty signs and wonders and miracles took place. Thousands and thousands of got, got saved. Within two years, a third of the city was converted, even in spite of their Jewish uh, prejudices at the beginning. And he says, now this is what God promised Abraham. It's happened to the city of Jerusalem. That particular people's group has had that promise fulfilled to them. Now, what we're being told in Genesis 12 is, is there isn't going to be a city, there isn't going to be a community. Let's take 
let's take the community of homosexuals and lesbians. They have their own sort of in integrate, you know, introverted lifestyle. Imagine God bursting into that community and so saving them and so transforming them that they don't live that way anymore. And there's all kinds of subcultures which you've got to be in the know to be allowed in. And you and I know this well enough. There's all kinds of nationalities. And, of course, people gather together out of their ethnicity. There's all sorts of reasons why people gather together. And we're being told that every single people's group on the face of the earth is going to be blessed like Jerusalem was for the first two years after the day of Pentecost. Okay, now, that, that excites me. Doesn't it you? You're very calm about it, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Abraham was the first person to build a rich inheritance to pass on to succeeding generations. Let's now study how he did it and why God chose him to be the root and source of that generational blessing that's going to flow to all mankind. Isn't that incredible? I think that Abraham could build such a store of treasure, it was enough to touch every people's group on the face of the earth. Just think about that. So Brother Wiersław from Poland, he can build up such a, a, a generational blessing capacity that there's not a, a Polish person that's not going to be touched by what flows out of him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Even Texas. <laughs> Wherever you come from. Oh God, give us the faith to believe these things. Yeah. So we're building up reserves in order that they might then be a blessing in this vast and wonderful way. Now I now want to put, bring you to three things which if you I'm going to do it in more detail probably today and, and the first session tomorrow morning but I want us to look at the three principles which I believe marked Abraham out to be a generational blesser. This is what made him rich and rich and rich with, with spiritual resources which could then be a blessing. And God decreed we're going to be a blessing to every people's group on the face of the earth. Number one, crucial choices were made. We're going to look through Genesis 11 to 22, and we're going to look into Hebrews chapter 11, but I want to summarize it in these three things. First of all, crucial choices were made. In this matter of choice, doesn't, God does not give us a clear commandment to obey or disobey. He just sets before us certain options, and we make the choice. Now, the reason that God does this sometimes is to reveal the heart. Because some people, if they've got the option, will make a choice which is economically beneficial. Or they'll make a choice, uh, you know, that's profitable in some other way. And others will make a choice, say, well, I know what God wants, so that's the choice I'm going to make. I know what's best for God or for his kingdom. Brother, I'm sorry to tell you that... Uh, uh, my, my company's offered me a promotion that I can't refuse, and so I'll be leaving the church a month from now. Uh, well, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know, but I can't, I can't turn this down. Well, he's made a choice. Yeah. Was it sin? Well, not in a, a strictly direct way, but he's made a choice that's going to affect him and going to affect his family for possibly generations. Because what he's doing, he's going to put the same genes into his kids. So when it comes to choices which might cost them something, they always choose what's best for the immediate and what's best for themselves. Now we'll see this later tomorrow when Lot had a choice and the choice he made was what seemed to be the most immediately economically beneficial for him. And it separated him from Abraham and it was necessary that it should because they were looking at things with different eyes. So every time you make a choice, you're either enriching your spiritual treasure or you're depleting your spiritual treasure. And, and how you use your gifts and talents, how you use your time, what priorities you choose to set, how your finances are handled, all these things are in your hands and God's not saying, do this, don't do that. He's just saying, right, here are, here's a certain amount of resources. Let's see what choices you make. You can either spend it on yourself and it's 
gone down the tube or you could you can invest it in the kingdom and now it's accumulating spiritual wealth to enhance the treasure that you've then got to pass on to someone else. Now just think about that, I could spend a lot of time on that. And I think we've got to ask ourselves two questions. What sort of choices am I making? What sort of impact is that having upon my children, natural and spiritual, so that they will then start to make similar choices? And as a result, what sort of treasure are we going to have or what um, debts are we going to have to pass on to the next generation? Next comes costly obedience. Now, it's easy to obey God when it's nice. Amen? But what about costly obedience? This began for Abraham in Genesis 12 when he had just obeyed God and left Haran not knowing where he was going. And this obedience, we'll find it tomorrow in greater detail. He, he makes lots of very costly obedience. The climax comes when he's not given the option, he's told by God to take your son, your only son, and take him as and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Now that doesn't make any any logical sense. It doesn't make any sense in any way. But what amazes me is that Abraham arose early the next day to go and do it. And it wasn't sensible. In fact, it seemed to be self-defeating, even in accomplishing the purposes of God. But God's voice was very clear. The commandment was very straightforward. It wasn't, it wasn't in any way confusing. And you only had a choice to obey or disobey. When my wife and I were six weeks old in Christ, God told us that we were to, I was to leave my lucrative and successful career, and she was doing great in what she was doing too, and we were to leave that and go, go to India. Now, you either say yes or no to that. And I won't go into the steps that then proceeded any more than it was easy for Abraham to obey, but the, but the decision was, I've heard God, I must obey. When God said, leave your father's house, it wasn't sort of, Abraham, you know, how would you like to have a new location? In fact, you might enjoy the climate better and, you know, maybe the schools are better for, you know, it wasn't like that, it was Abraham, leave. And you had the choice to obey or disobey. Now, how do you respond to that? I mean, can you hear God well enough? And maybe, because it tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, that one of the problems with lack of spiritual hearing is the disobediences that we've gone into. You've become dull of hearing through disobedience. Now, I'm convinced that everybody, when they're born again, they're born again with the ability to hear God totally convinced, like from my own experience and from observing others. Within two hours of getting saved, I got home to my house with Eileen, and at that time, we were both smokers, not desperate chain smokers, but we were both smokers. And uh, I took out the packet of cigarettes and gave one to Eileen, and, and, I, and I said, boy, that was quite an experience, wasn't it? And, and I was about to light up when I heard the voice of God for the first time. And he just said to me, you don't need those anymore, throw them away. And I said, oh, that's God. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did, well, I thought, well, obviously you obey God. I didn't know Christians who disobeyed God yet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought all Christians did obey God, because it seemed to me that's what Christianity was about, among other things. <laughs> so I took her cigarette without asking her, and took mine and said, God just said, we're not to smoke anymore. So I threw them in the trash and I've never smoked since. And it was the easiest thing in the world to do because God gives you grace to do what he tells you to do. My next experience was two or three days later. I was going to my first um, um, meeting of, I, I was 
sort of co-opted into a youth group. I was a bit old for the youth group, but I was as ignorant as ignorant, so it was good. I went to these Bible studies, and they were having a, a sort of a, an evangelistic evening, and I was on my way to this meeting, riding my motorcycle, which I rode in those days, and riding, I can't remember whether she was on the back or not, I've forgotten that detail, but anyway, on the way to this meeting, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, he said, buy some coffee and some sugar. I heard it just the same way I heard it the other day. I thought, oh, I better obey that. I didn't know what for or why. I just stopped at a grocery store, bought coffee and sugar, stuck it in the pannier on my motorcycle, got to the meeting, and the meeting went on. And then suddenly, when it came to refreshment time, the girls ran out in the panic and said, oh, we haven't got any coffee or sugar. And I said, don't worry. And I thought, I'm the man of God with you. you know. <laughs> and I got my coffee and my sugar, and said, well, the Lord told me on the way to bring it, because he said you were going to forget. <laughs> there was a bit of a sting, a bit of, you know, a little bit of pride, which God has dealt with somewhat since then. <laughs> I was raw, I was rough, but I could hear God. And I can honestly say to you, I've never left, lost my ability to hear God, because I've always obeyed him. It's really that simple. But Hebrews chapter 5 says that we can become dull of hearing through disobedience. And maybe some of us here, we're going to have to repent of that and say, Lord, I want my hearing back, and I tell you, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. In, in childlike simplicity. It, just, it doesn't matter whether it makes sense. It doesn't matter whether it's convenient. It doesn't matter whether it's impossible. It doesn't matter if it's going to be terribly, terribly painful. It ended up with my wife and I, three years later, still trying to get to India, and I kept being turned down by every mission because of my dreadful health at the time. And I was told because of this likelihood of me having a very serious hemorrhages from my nose, it wasn't just a drip of blood, I'd used pints of blood, I had to be rushed into emergency several times, and, and I could easily, he, he said, you need to stay near a hospital, which was absolute logical common sense. I totally agree with the reason, but the trouble was it didn't agree with what God was saying. And my wife, I'm glad to say, and I, we both agreed that I'm going to have to obey God. And I thought, well, when I step on the boat, on my way to India out of obedience, God's going to miraculously heal me. Well, I had the worst nosebleed of my life the first night on the boat, and I nearly died. I really did. I was in a terrible state. When I got to Bombay, I was just uh, as white as a sheet, having lost so much blood. Eileen was, had been in premature labor, and we were just in a, you know, we had battle after battle to get there, but we got there. Well, 12 years later, God healed me. 12 years, and now you can see this fantastic, fit, healthy specimen, but it, it was 12 years later. But I learned to obey God. And this is one of the great things which I'm hammering home to you, because if you will adopt an Abrahamic standard of obedience and an Abrahamic standard of choices, then you and I, we're going to start to accumulate tremendous wealth for ourselves and then we can pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. Alright, let's move on to the third thing. Faith that really believes God unconditionally. Now I point out in the next little sentence, and we're going to spend some more time on this tomorrow, but I just want to make the point that Abraham's faith was progressively developed from Genesis, Genesis 15 onwards until it came to full measure in the ultimate test in Genesis 22 when Abraham actually took Isaac to, to kill him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, and at the same time was believing that he was going to bring him back again alive. In other words, he had, he had Isaac raised from the dead by faith even before he stuck the knife in him. Now the Bible teaches us that very clearly. And it was so, such a glorious picture of the Heavenly Father and his beloved son Jesus that it was so close to God's heart that you can see that he went all the way. But he declared before he got on Mount Moriah, he said, he said, we, I and the lad, we will, we, so you stay here, we're, we're going to come back to you. Yet he had every intention of, of slaying Isaac and had every confidence that as he was the child of promise, God had to raise him from the dead in order to fulfill what he promised him. So there had to be a resurrection. That was all his logical mind could see as a possible outcome to this. But he, it wasn't going to stop him obeying. 
Now, he didn't get there in one step. He got there by a series of steps, which we will look at tomorrow. But I want to make this as plain and as clear as I can, that, that, that the main route to be richly endowed with generational blessing for yourself and for those that you're able to pass it on to is that you yourself go through this rigorous school of faith until you've got the kind of faith that Abraham had. We're going to look at it in more detail tomorrow of how you get there because it didn't, you see, this is, God loves to take people that are hopeless and, and, and these are all like Jacob. Who, you, I mean, Jacob was such a mess. I mean, he, he talk about everything being wrong. I mean, his family life was wrong, everything was wrong, and he was all twisted and messed up. But when God finished with him, he became a prince with God and with men. So God's saying, look, I can take the most messed up of you. I don't care what your family background is. I don't care what you've been through. You haven't got to go on wounded and useless, just staggering to church and being maintained by others. You can become a mighty prince with God if you'll go through the process of transformation. If I did it to Jacob, I can do it to you. And it's the same is true of Abraham. God didn't choose Abraham because he had faith. He chose him because he hadn't got a, a clue how to believe. In fact, when God first said what he was going to do, Abraham just laughed in incredulity and tried all sorts of fiddly ways with his wife to get round God's difficulties to help God answer his prayers because he couldn't believe God could really do it. But when God had finished with Abraham, as we shall look at tomorrow, it says in Romans 4, verse 21, it says Abraham was now fully persuaded that what God had said he was also well able to perform. He became as much a believer as God in God's word. And that's real faith. And God can get you from wherever you are to that place. And then as a result, you're going to build vast resources of rich deposits which are going to be blessing to you, but even more a blessing to those that follow you. All right, now let's move on and begin to look at some of this in de detail. We'll do a little bit tonight and then we're going to finish the rest of it off tomorrow. Let's go, let's start, turn to scripture now. Let's come to Genesis 11. We're going to spend a little time on this because this is one of the main biblical examples of what we're talking about. Genesis chapter 11 and come to verse 27 just at the end of Genesis 11. And then we're told the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. So we know from this that Lot is the, the first, is the nephew of Abraham, or Abram as he was then called. And then it says in verse 29 that Abram and Nahor took wives, the name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Issachar. But Sarah, Sarai, as she was then called, was barren because she had no child. And then Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Now if you get a map out and locate Ur of the Chaldeans and look how they went to come to the land of Canaan, they were probably completed about between three quarters at least of the journey. Probably nearer, nearer um, four fifths of the journey. And this is the tragedy in a way for that particular generation. They went most of the journey and then stopped at Haran and never went into the promised land. And that's what a lot of people do. Okay, we're going to start a city-wide prayer ministry to see transformation in our city. And we'll go from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. Hello. And then we'll stop there. We'll get maybe, probably 80% of the way, maybe a little bit more than that. And Terah died there. Hello. And there have been great movements in the United States of America particularly 
over the last century particularly, which have promised to get us where we're supposed to go, and they've gone a long way, then they stop there. And then the terror, whoever he may be, some of them are great and wonderful men of God, and to think that of the courage to, to go all that way in that daring way and then to stop there and die there, it, 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 it's, it's impressive in many ways and yet it's so disappointing in other ways. And then God comes to Abraham as he's still called at that time and he speaks to him. He says the days of terror were 205 years, but he still didn't make it. Hello. I mean, this, this is almost as, as old as this nation, certainly of Texas. Just think about that. It's, such, it's called the Bible Belt. It's got so much that's, that's a blessing and so much. And you think, how can Texas have so many God-loving and so much beautiful, you know, I've never seen so many fishes on the backs of cars in all my life. <laughs> and if you, and, 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 and where was it? I was on a plane and there were five seats and every one of those five seats was occupied by a Christian. I thought, you would never find this any, anywhere else in the world. And yet at the same time, there's every kind of wickedness and darkness and evil sweeping into our cities and, we, and into our schools and we seem to be having no interest or power to stop it. And it utterly frustrates me. Does it not you? <coughs> well, we've stopped at terror, you know, we've stopped at Haram. We've gone a long way from where we were and it took us 200 years to get here but now we're settled down into a kind of comfy and you know, reasonably pleasant and it's ever so nice and people are so kind and sweet and I've never met people that I've loved more than Texans in their, their openness and their friendliness and their kindness and their goodness and yet I think how can we how can evil thrive in this environment? There's something wrong here. Isn't anybody as mad about it as I am? We can send a team to Poland and they can get into the public schools and witness and win Jesus, people for Jesus. They can do the same thing in Kenya. They can even do the same thing now in Albania. But you try and do it in the senior high school in Bear County and you could be in jail. You could even go to jail for praying in the name of, we mustn't say who. <laughs> Come on. Are we going to go all the way? And possess the land? Well, you better leave your father's house. And what was okay for him isn't okay for this pioneer generation that are going to take us somewhere. Leave your father's house. And Abraham obeyed. And he didn't know where he was going. He just knew that he couldn't stay where he was because it wasn't where he was supposed to be. This was not the promised land. I mean, the promised land, I mean, I can think of a Texas where, you know, as I said, there's no drug addiction. There's not a drug pusher anyway because they've all been converted. There's, oh, I mean, why can't we dream dreams as big as God? And then why can't we believe that God can take a little bunch of nothing nobodies like you and me and make it happen? Why can't we, we so possess our possessions and so get into our inheritance that we've got something of great wealth to pass on to our next spiritual generation? Because I haven't got time to wait for natural generations. I mean, we could probably reproduce spiritually every five years. I remember, Mo, I'm sure Mohan will remember this. Where was it? Oh, it was, the, it was a village near to Armour the first occasion when someone was raised from the dead. The guy that God used wasn't even two years old in Christ. He'd come out of dark pagan Hinduism but had so met the living God. 
that when he was asked to pray a prayer from the Christians with all the Hindus at a Hindu funeral ceremony with this corpse lying on the top of the funeral pile waiting to be burned, would you pray a blessing from your God upon this lady to help her in the next life? He said, arise in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and she sat up on the funeral pile. And here was the interesting thing, is that, that when she came alive on the funeral pyre, which was, I forget exactly how long, but it was getting on for 24 hours from when she had died of terrible cancer in her bowels, um, when she sat up, she said she had met Jesus and she was now believing in Jesus. So she died a Hindu and came back to life again as a Christian, which blows my theological mind. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Come on, we're going to have these things in Texas. Excuse me being a bit pointed because, of, I mean, let's say America and Canada and, and all the other great nations that are represented here. But I want, I want to stir you to say, well, okay, thank God for my Christian forefathers and how far they brought us from the darkness in which my nation once lived. But we haven't gone all the way. We might be 80% of the way, like say you might possibly put Texas there. This lovely Bible belt where everybody, you know, you can pray in a restaurant and you'll find half the other people are praying too. And you think, why have we got, haven't we got more power to change this place? Amen. So Abraham obeyed and he didn't know where he was going he moved from Haram to Shechem God appeared to him promised to give him the land and he built an altar to the God who had appeared to him that's verses 6 and 7 he then moved to Bethel the house of God that's what the name means built another altar and called upon the name of the Lord Abraham moves Genesis 12 9 through 13 5 Abraham moved from Bethel to the Negev somewhere in the south there's a famine and here's the listen Abraham goes to Egypt for health and this is a recurring theme in scripture you'll find again and again when God's people get into trouble where do they go for help and did they ever get a blessing by going to Egypt did it not always cause them to end up in trouble was if they'd stayed dependent on God would he not have delivered them supernaturally and will they not now be vindicated for their faith so Abraham, he said he's still, he's still a kid in faith, still learning principles. But at least he's on the road, and what's more, he's willing to learn. Because now he then is afraid they're going to kill him, and Sarai must have been the most beautiful 90-year-old lady there ever was, because everybody's desiring her. I better not say what I was going to say. Now, I'll keep that private. <laughs> you can ask me afterwards if you want to know what I was going to say. <laughs> So Abraham says, Look, we're going to have to lie. And, and, and you think, wait a minute, Abraham, you've got a promise that you're going to bring forth a seed. And, and, and no one can kill you right now, but he can't see that then. And he's only rescued from this horrible situation. He's, so, so Abraham's fearful. He tells lies, and he goes off to Egypt for help. You see, there's plenty of immaturity here. Can you see that? That's why this process had to go on for years and years before God could begin to fulfill his promise. He's rescued by divine intervention and he returns to the Negev and Lot's still with him. He returns to Bethel, the house of God. He goes back to the church he hasn't been for the last 15 years because he's been back, last 15 months because he's been backsliding. Builds an altar to the Lord. And he calls upon the name of the Lord. And what I want you to point out, which again, if you read the scriptures, you'll see why it's there. I have not time to read it all. He goes back to the same altar, calls again on the name of the Lord. Abraham is now choosing a particular lifestyle of actively seeking as a first priority the presence of God. Now you can see that in the scripture. 
In other words, what's going to be his lifestyle now is he's going to have a secret place, if you like, to put it in New Testament terms, a place where he goes and he and God meet each other and that's going to be the, the unshakable foundation of his life. And as he begins to develop this lifestyle, he and God become face-to-face -face friends. So I want you to see, this is, this is a principle, that the development of faith is so connected to intimacy with God that you cannot separate them. Because God himself, thanks, God himself is the only real believer that there is. God has written in his word and God is totally confident that everything he said he's quite capable and able to make it happen. And God's eternal life is a, a life, the very life of God is shot through with the, the overwhelming confidence that he's never going to have to modify his word because he's got the power and the glory to make it all come to pass. So, so the way to come to faith is, is, to, is to start a, a life of ever-increasing intimacy, of finding a way, not necessarily to build an altar like Abraham, but as Jesus recommends in Matthew 6.6, 6, no, Jesus commands in Matthew 6.6, 6, go and find a secret place, shut the door, and spend time with God. Yeah. As a first priority. And if you do that, and you and God start to, and it's not a one way, you don't go with a shopping list, you go to meet with God. He may spend more time talking to you than you spend time talking to him. That shows that you're maturing in your prayer life. And as you go into that ever-increasing intimacy, there is a, an infusion, an ever-increasing impartation of the very life of God, and as a result, that life of God, which only knows how to believe, becomes your life, and you find yourself beginning to believe like God because you're now living by the very life of God. And you'll find every scripture, which I could turn to a lot, but I haven't time, you'll find every scripture that's talking about faith connects you to the eternal life of God and to a life of intimacy. Let's just look at two. They're not on your notes, but you can write them in, can't you? 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's look at that one. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse 12, he's handing over the baton to Timothy. Timothy's now receiving, if you like, the final impartation, which we're going to look at later, of a whole process of father-son successful generational transmission. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Next exhortation, lay hold of, grab hold of. You know, it's got a ton of, you know, Timothy, get this. This eternal life to which you were called. If you've got the life, you've got the faith. That's what he's saying. Lay hold of the eternal life. Now come to 2 Peter. Peter has learned this from Jesus and now he's practicing it. He's about to, he's at the end of his life. He's writing a few things to people before he departs. And as he begins his second letter, written from the condemned cell, and he's not a bit bothered about dying, he's just concerned about these people going on to continue to be a successful next generation. The burden of all these letters is the next generation, the next generation. They must come at least to where I am. And we read his writing, verse 1 of Second Peter, chapter 1. I'm writing to those who have obtained, have also grabbed hold of, have also received the same precious faith that we have by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now as Peter says, look, I became a man of faith by grabbing hold of that life, by, by receiving that life, and now I'm stepping out and doing the same miracles that Jesus was doing. I watched Jesus raise the dead, I just went and did it like him, and bingo, it worked for me. And the key is because I've got the same faith. 
And there was a time I didn't have it. I hadn't got a clue. Jesus spoke to me that I've got to learn how to, to receive the very faith of God. And I learned how to do that by the life of intimacy. Let's just go on and read what he next says. This is Peter writing. Now, these guys are writing scripture, but they're also writing their personal experience. Otherwise, they wouldn't write it. He's talking about what's already happened to him. Verse 3, his divine power, I'm going to give you the literal translation of the, of the tenses, has already given to us, past perfect tense, everything necessary for life and godliness through the deep, intimate, intimate knowledge of God. And the word that's used here is a word which is more intimate than when a man knows his wife in sexual intimacy. He uses a stronger word than that. He says, my, inter my intimacy with God is greater than in any way that I know my wife. And this faith comes to me through that relationship. His divine power has already granted to me everything necessary for life and godliness in the deep intimacy of knowing him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. What a fantastic thing for Peter to say. And he has given us exceeding great and precious promises by which we may become the partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. And he's talking about this present world because there ain't any corruption in heaven. Amen? He said, look, guys, I found a way of, 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 of victory and power. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I got there by getting intimate with the Father, the way Jesus taught us, and the eternal life of the Father flowing into me. And I'm doing the miracles of Jesus. I'm living like Jesus. And it's all by the power of that relationship. Okay? So, Abraham then starts a lifestyle of intimacy. And then you'll find, I'm going to close with this, Genesis 13, when he starts to live this new life of total, utter passion for God, it's not long before he discovers that he and Lot are no longer able to walk together. And so there starts to be strife between them. And I tell you, if you're in the kind of church which doesn't like this sort of thing, then you may find that when you start getting absolutely passionate that there's a, there's a difficulty to continue. Now, I'm not urging or advocating any kind of division. I'm just saying that if you're going to have to make a choice, God's more important. And the fact that everybody in your particular church and fellowship don't go with you isn't necessarily a reason for parting, but if, if, if you find that there's constant rows and bickering and division over the way that you're trying to go in different directions now, then an amicable parting might be a better solution to the problem. So Abraham says, well, look, look you choose. And, I, and Lot lifts up his eyes in a natural way and sees the well-watered plain and thinks, well, it looks like to me that it's going to be economically advantageous to me to go towards Sodom. So he makes a natural choice on the basis of economic prosperity. And Abraham makes a choice on God's purpose and destiny in his life. And they have to part company. And the reason is because Lot isn't a son, he's a nephew. Hello. And there's lots of relationships between mature men of God and they'll discover that they haven't got a son they thought they had. In fact, he's a nephew. And if that's causing constant collision and constant conflict because you're not going in the same direction, then you probably have to make the same decision. Amen? And the moment that decision was made, then God appeared again to Abraham, confirmed the promise, and he blessed him. And we will continue tomorrow to look at what happened after that.